So last time we were talking about the importance of experimental uh, uh, uncertainties, and I've had a um, couple of questions about this, so, but this, is, this should hopefully answer uh, the question. So in science, when we have an uncertainty in a measurement, which is all the time, you never do a perfect measurement. There's always an uncertainty there, and we quote those uncertainties explicitly. Right? So if we have a, a, a number, you'll see a plus minus and then an experimental uh, uncertainty uh, after it, and that tells you how accurate that number is. Um, if you miss these out, right, then you run into problems because, for example, uh, to use the Edmonton Journal, uh, there was a report that claimed that the rate of getting uh, uh, MS is 2.4% in the general population, but 6.7% if you've had a, a hepatitis B vaccination within three years. But what that tells you is absolutely nothing. There is zero information contained in that statement because neither of these numbers have uncertainties. So the next time you're reading a, a medical report or a scientific report in a, in a, in a paper and it's you know, doom, gloom, end of the world, we're all going to get sick and, and drop dead or whatever, um, you should look at the statistics. And if they quote numbers and they don't give experimental uncertainties, then those numbers are completely without any value whatsoever because there's a huge difference if you put in the uncertainties here and you said it's 2.4 plus or minus 0.1 uh, versus 6.7 plus or minus 0.2, that suddenly means that, wow, there does look like there's a statistically significant effect. Of course, it doesn't rule out that there's some systematic error in the way they did the experiment. You know, they may have preferentially, you know, the, the people that have hep B may be exposed to something else, uh, and that's what causes MS. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't some sort of uh, uh, other cause, but it does mean that at least you've got a st statistically significant result, whereas if you uh, put in the uncertainties and they look like this, then that would mean that, well, okay, you just had a statistical fluctuation and you've got slightly more uh, um, uh, people with hep, uh, uh, hepatitis B uh, vaccinations getting MS. So it's very important that you include statistical uh, uh, uncertainties, or at least when you're writing a scientific paper or you want somebody to take your results uh, um, sensibly. Uh, and so this was the example we, we briefly covered at the end with the uh, Guardian reporter uh, correctly guessing 14 out of 24 cards and immediately believing that they, they developed ESP um, when really oh, this was just a symptom of the fact they didn't understand statistics. So again, always important to include experimental uncertainties. So what this means is if you have a, a plus minus uh, uh, here, it's what you would expect if you repeated the experiment a number of times, it is the range in which you would expect, it's actually 60, it's, it's not 66%, it's, it's, 60, it's two thirds, 67. It's actually, if you do the, the full calculation, it's, it's 68%, but it's typically expressed as, as the range where you'd want two thirds of the results to lie. So that would mean that if you tossed a coin 100 times, you got 45 heads, you'd report this number as 45 plus or minus 10, um, which is, I won't tell you how we calculate the well, it's just the square root of the number of toin costs uh, is the uncertainty here. And so that meant, means that if we repeated the experiment 100 times, then out of those 100 times, we would expect uh, two thirds of them to lie within this range, but it also means that we expect a third of them to lie outside that range. So this is something that's always a good thing when you're doing your, your lab plots. And uh, you sometimes see this where you end up with, uh, you, know, you draw your, your points uh, for a straight line plot and you draw your error bars and then you have some beautiful straight line that goes almost perfectly through the middle of all the points and certainly well within the error bars. That's actually not what you would expect. Since each error bar that you draw on a plot means two thirds of the results should lie within there. The other way of looking at that is that if you have nine points uh, on your line, you'd expect about a third of them to lie outside, you know, at least one error bar away from the line. So if you've got, well, you, you've got to take account also the degrees of freedom, because obviously if you have two points, the straight line will go through the middle of the two things. So um, you, you, you've got to subtract off your degrees of freedom. But it's not, you shouldn't be looking at these plots and saying, my goodness, one of my points you know, lies beyond the error bar away from a straight line. You actually expect that. A third of all the points should lie one, what we call standard deviation away from the line. 
So it's, it's worth uh, remembering that. Um, and this, in fact, the reason that this error is just uh, uh, two-thirds, uh, covers the range of two-thirds of the results, is why when you see scientific discoveries, at least in physics, uh, the, sta the, the, the standard for claiming a discovery is something new. So, you know, if we're at the LHC and we see evidence of the, of the Higgs boson, uh, we don't claim discovery of a new particle like the Higgs boson until we have results that are five times further away than these error bars. And then the probability of it just being a random fluctuation rather than being one third of the time is just a random fluctuation. Um, it reduces the probability of it just being a random fluctuation to 0.0057%. And at that point you say, well, okay, it's so unlikely that it's just a random fluctuation that we actually now believe that we've seen something new that's not explainable by uh, the physical models that we have up to that point. So the, uh, si the, the, for, for physical discoveries, the sort of the accepted standard, obviously it's not a hard and fast rule, but the accepted standard is uh, a five sigma, as it's called, five standard deviations, where this is one standard deviation, five standard deviation difference. Okay, so the errors also determine the number of significant figures that you quote something to. Not the other way around. I know you learnt at school that you quote something to this many significant figures and then that tells you the accuracy. It's the other way around is how it actually works. You determine how accurately you can measure something and then when you've got that accuracy, you, you know the uncertainty on your measurement, you quote the central result to the same degree of accuracy, right? So, for example, if you've got a quantity and you measure it to be you know, 1.234 plus or minus 0.078, right, that's a correct way to state it. You know the uncertainty is 0.078. You typically quote uncertainties to usually about two uh, significant figures. You don't go beyond two. Sometimes you just do one, but, but two is, I suppose, the most typical. And then you quote the measurement to the same absolute accuracy as your uncertainty because... There is no point in adding extra digits beyond the four here because you know, your uncertainty is a lot bigger than you know, the, the uh, ten thousandths that you'd be adding uh, on here. Right? So when you're quoting a number in significant figures, when you've got an uncertainty, you quote it to exactly the same absolute precision as your uncertainty. So if your uncertainty in this case happened to be you know, 0.1, then you would quote it as 1.2 plus or minus 0.1. Right? It's not the number of significant figures that's important for the measurement. It's the precision. You quote the measurement to the same precision, uh, to, the the, to the same degree of precision as your uncertainty allows. Right? So you would not write it like this because you've got uh, uh, an uncertainty of seven and, uh, seven and eight on these digits here. So you've absolutely no clue that these are five and six. Right? I mean, you've written it down here that you, you really have no idea that these are five and six, so you don't include them there because they're completely inaccurate, right? Um, now, when we're doing the problems that you're gonna have for the assignments, these are theoretical problems. Now, if I was doing it absolutely precisely, I would give you, uh, you know, uncertainties on each physical value, and then you would spend, you know, 90% of your time figuring out how to propagate errors through the question, and, and about 10% of your time actually, you know, worrying about the physics that we, that you, that, that you know, I, I want you to learn from the examples. So. For the problems that we do in the lectures here, I will almost never quote an uncertainty. They will almost always be exact values, and you should treat them as exact values, right? It does not matter. There is no difference in the problems between 4.0 and 4, or 4.000, right? They are exactly the same. So if I, if, if I give you an uncertainty, it will be explicitly stated there. It will be 4.0 plus or minus 0.2. Right? And the reason for this is simply that you know, if you use the significant figures, that doesn't tell you what the uncertainty is. You're, you're limited to uncertainties that are powers of 10, uh, and that's not particularly helpful because uncertainties don't come in nice orders of 10. Uh, the other problem is, is that when you use this and you say, well, if you give me the numbers to two significant figures and I, I always quote my answer to the same number of significant figures, that's wrong. Uh, you've got it. If you're going to do an uncertainty calculation, you actually have to propagate the uncertainties through. And you may find that if your numbers are good to one significant figure, your answer may be good to three or four significant figures or, or no significant figures at all, right? It depends on how the thing 
things uh, 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 cancel out and, and, and propagate through. So it's, it's, it's wrong. Um, it gets in the way uh, of doing things. So for the theory uh, uh, questions that you'll be doing in the lectures, just quote your answers to three to five significant figures. Um, there are one or two cases when we get to relativity where you may be asked to quote it to more than five significant figures, in which case it will explicitly say so in the question. Right? It, will, it will state, you know, quote your answer to six or seven significant figures. There are very few situations where that's actually needed. Uh, the vast majority of cases, um, I mean, I can only think of about one or two examples where that's ever cropped up in this course. Uh, uh, every other time, you quote it to three to five significant figures. Right? Uh, anything in that range is fine, but you do not, do not worry about the number of significant figures in the question. Right? That's, that's irrelevant. Um, there, there is no hidden uncertainty in the number of digits that I give you when I'm giving you a number. It's an absolute, it will be explicitly stated. Okay, so combining uncertainties is a very complicated thing to do. Um, you'll have some simple formulae, uh, uh, I think, in your lab manual. Um, you know, so, for example, if, you're, if you've got a quantity X and a quantity Y, and each of these has got an uncertainty on it, uh, then, and, and you've got a quantity F that's the sum of these, then for uncorrelated errors, so in other words, if the uncertainty on X is completely varies completely independently from the uncertainty on Y, then this is how you combine the uncertainties to find the, the net uncertainty on the sum of the two quantities. Um, and you can derive these from things called partial derivatives, which you will not be having to worry about this year. I think the lab manual uh, uh, briefly describes them, but, but it's not required that you know them at all. Um, but it's just there so that next year, when you've done partial derivatives, you can come back to this and you can figure out your own ways to calculate uh, uh, your own uncertainty propagations. So before, before you do partial derivatives, um, things will be kept relatively simple, particularly in the labs. Uh, once you've done partial derivatives, it actually becomes a lot easier to calculate your own uh, uh, uncertainties on quantities. Um, however, right, even when you've done this, one of the big problems with experiments is it can be very hard to determine whether errors are correlated or not. So are these two errors correlated? Are they not correlated? Um, and dealing with things that are partially correlated is a, is a nightmare. Now, that's not something you will deal with until you get to, to graduate school. Um, so that's a difficulty. And sometimes it can be very tricky to deal with these things because there can be hidden correlations that your intuition hides from you. So, let's do a simple question. So a man has got two children, one of whom is a boy. What is the probability that the other child is also a boy? So you've got five answers there, A, B, C, D, or E. Okay, so what have we got? So there's 79% uh, uh, of you have gone for a 50% chance that the other child is, uh, is also a boy. Okay, so I, I, I won't have you discuss it because it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very uh, tricky, um, tricky thing, but I'll tell you the right answer. C, it's a third, right? Um, so congratulations to the 12 of you that got it right. So, this is not, I, I mean, it was, it was a little bit of a trick question, but, uh, but here's why, right? And, and this is why it can be very tricky sometimes to spot these hidden correlations. So, so if we've got two children, then we've got, uh, uh, you know, child one and child two. Oops. And so we've got four possible combinations. We can have boy, boy. We can have boy, girl. We can have girl, boy. Or we can have girl, girl. However, we're told that at least one of the children is a boy. So that rules out this possibility here. It can't have two girls because we're told that one is a boy. So if we look at the other three possibilities, Right? One of these child, uh, one of these child is a boy. 
In this case, we've got uh, um, the other one is a boy, so that's uh, okay. Here we have one, who, one who's a boy, the other who's a girl, so that one is not, right? The, the second child is not a, a, a boy in that case. And here we have the girl and then we have the boy, so we've got one who's a boy, but the other one who's a, a girl, so this one is not. Since each of these combinations is equally likely, we've got one where the other child is a boy, but we have two where the other child is a girl, and so we have uh, uh, one out of three, which gives us 33%. And that's why the answer is C, and the answer is not D, because what has been forgotten is the fact that when I say one is a boy, it's not clear whether it was the first child or the second child. So there's two possibilities, right? And there's only one possibility where both are boys. So the probability becomes a third, and it's hidden correlations like that that can get you into real trouble. So we'll try uh, another one, and this is actually a, a real example, right? This is one which caught out uh, 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 scientists. So imagine you're on a game show, right? And, and this game show has, uh, uh, one of the games is there are three doors. And behind two of the doors, there is a goat. And behind the third door, there is a car. And obviously, you want to pick the door with the car. So the way the game works is you pick one of the three doors at random. You've no idea which door, the, the, uh, which door contains the car. So you pick one of the three doors. The game show host then opens up one of the two remaining doors that you haven't chosen and shows you a goat. You then have the option. You can stick with the door that you first picked, or you can switch to the other door that hasn't been opened. And the question is, wh which are you best doing? Are you best sticking with the door that you first had? Are you better off switching to the other door does it make any difference? I mean, is there any difference in switching? It's you know, just as likely either way. Um, it's impossible to say which one is, is best or, uh, yeah, okay, the silly Monty Python one. Um, okay, so pick your answer. Yeah, the, the, I'll give you a hint. Answer E is not the right one. <laughs> Okay, so we'll stop, we'll stop at 30 seconds. Okay, so now, now and nobody's certain what the right answer is. <laughs> I've got you panicking now. <laughs> so I'll, 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 I'll show you the right answer. There. So actually, oops, whoa, come back. Hang on a minute. It was A. <laughs> I'll see if I can get it back to the A. There we go. Okay. So A is the right answer. Right? So the way that this works is simply that you've got three doors. So when you pick one, so say you pick this one, right, you've got a 33% chance of being correct, right? So that means that the car lies behind one of these two doors. So 66% of the time, it's behind one of those two doors. So if you wait for the game show host to open one of those two doors, you know, for example, let's say that it's not behind that door because that's the door uh, the game show host opens and shows you the, the goat. And so you've got a 66% chance now that the car is behind this door and only a 33% chance that it's behind your door. And the reason for that is because the game show host has added additional information to the problem by showing you 
that it's not one of the two doors that you didn't pick. And so that addition of information has now changed the probabilities in the experiment and leads to trouble if you happen to be doing a similar uh, type of thing with, with gorillas. Um, so this was a, a bunch of psychology experiments in the, or not gorillas, I think it was chimpanzees, in the uh, 1950s and 60s. And what they did was they gave a, a, a chimpanzee two colored smarties. You know, so they gave it a red one and a blue one. And you know, a, a chimpanzee would you know, have some color preference, obviously, in its head, and it would uh, pick, say, the blue smarty. So it, it's, 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 it takes and eats the blue smarty, and the, the red one's taken away. And then what they did, what they were trying to show is that once you've made a decision and you've selected something, that it reinforces that in your mind, and then blue becomes a lot more desirable since you've selected it over red. Blue suddenly now becomes more desirable than, uh, than every other color. And, or, or at least you know, there's some probability that it becomes more desirable. So then they gave the same chimpanzee a blue smarty and a green smarty and observed that two-thirds of the time it would pick the blue smarty over the green smarty. But what they'd actually just demonstrated was nothing at all. Um, it was just random probability because if you think about it, the chimpanzee, uh, if, you, if you assume the chimpanzee has got some predetermined color preference that you don't know what it is, it can be red, green, blue. You could have green, blue, uh, red, or you can have um, blue, uh, red, green, right? So I, I think actually there's six in total. Is, is that all the combinations? Probably not. Uh, so I mean, there's multiple combinations. But if you look at all the combinations you can have, what you find is if you look at the ones where green, uh, where red is, uh, no, what should we say? We said blue is ahead of red. So blue is ahead of red here. Um, Blue is ahead of red here, so obviously there are six combinations. So if you total them all up, what you find is that out of the combinations where blue is ahead of red, then in two-thirds of them, blue is also ahead of green. Right? So there's six different combinations. Uh, if you add them all up, then you find that two-thirds of the time, if blue is better than, than red, blue is also going to be better than, than green because there's only so many different permutations and combinations. So it's always worth uh, uh, taking a little bit of care with your statistics. So the last thing that's worth mentioning for, for experiments is uh, you also have to be careful, of course, with your initial conditions. Sometimes minor differences in your initial conditions and setups can also be relevant. So you want to be make a careful note of that and a careful note of what assumptions you are making when you do an experiment, because sometimes those assumptions, you may think that they're irrelevant, um, but they can come back and, and bite you later. OK, so we've finished units and, and measurements now. We've talked about what physics is. We've talked about how we make measurements and how we add those measurements, uh, whether they're scalars or, or vectors. Uh, we've talked about base units and how those lead to derived units just to keep our life simple. Um, and uh, uh, we've also talked about how vectors are, are, are not trivial to add and how when you're doing experiments, you have to be very careful to uh, uh, note down initial conditions and, uh, and, and take care of the statistics. So any questions on that? It could, right? But but if you've picked if you you've picked the the, the what's happened is you've picked a door. So there's a 33% chance that the door you picked is right, right? So you've got two two possibility trees now, right? You've got one where you picked the right door, in which case the game show host opens a random door and and, and off you go, right? Um, but the, and, you know, and if you switch, you you lose out. But two thirds of the time, you are more likely to have not picked the door with the car, right? which means that now you've got two doors and you've no information about which door the car is behind, so it doesn't help you, right? I mean, you know, at that point, you've got no help. But then the game show host happily opens the door and says, it's not behind this door. So now, once he's added that extra bit of information, right, you've, you've suddenly now got a two-thirds chance that it's behind the door that you didn't open because originally you had a two-thirds chance it was behind either of those two doors 
He's now said it's not behind one of those doors, and you now have the same chance that it's behind the, 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 uh, the, the remaining door. Right. Okay, think about it, think about it. There's, there's actually a website you can go to. Uh, it's the Monty Hall effect, right? There's actually a little website with a, with a, 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 a Java uh, applet or Flash applet. You can go there, and, and it will actually, you can, you can try it multiple times, switching and not switching, and, 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 and convince yourself that it does actually work. <laughs> but I, no, I, I, I know where you're coming from, right? It's, it's, these things, you have a certain picture in your mind of how the statistics work, and it's not always right. Um, and so it's always worth uh, challenging that model that you've got in your mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first time I heard this, that was my reaction too. So, um, why is this not working? So the next section of the course is kinematics, right? So this is the, uh, the basic study of motion. So we're not going to get onto mechanics and dynamics, which is the study of how we create motion. This is the study uh, of motion itself. And since it's something that I'm assuming you've already done in high school, uh, we're going to go through this pretty quickly, but we'll slow down when we get to the bits dealing with, uh, with calculus. So first thing uh, we want to define kinematics study of objects in motion and so if you're moving your position is changing and so therefore you have something that we call a displacement and displacement is obviously a vector I can be displaced backwards I can be displaced forwards, sideways if I could fly I could be displaced upwards um, so you can be displaced in a particular uh, uh, direction so we've got a, a vector and the displacement vector is the difference between the initial position of the object and the final position of the object, right? So if you consider motion during a period of time, the displacement is the change in position between your start and your end, right? So large changes in a quantity, since we're going to be dealing with changes in a quantity, if we're dealing with large changes in a quantity, we use the capital uh, letter uh, from Greek, delta, which is uh, just a nice little triangle. And so if you've got a displacement, usually we denote position as x. So a change in displacement will be written as delta x. A big, big change, macroscopic change in displacement will be delta x. Um, so either you will see it used as delta x. Sometimes you also see displacement written as s. And x is what is typically used for position, right? So if you see something that says x, that's typically an absolute position in some coordinate system. Delta x or s are the variables that are used typically to describe uh, displacement. I mean, this is just convention. Uh, you can call it anything you like. Um, but if you are going to use non-standard variables in the exam, in the written answer section, please make it clear to me what you mean by those variables. If you want to call displacement m, um, make sure that you've written down somewhere, I am calling displacement m because I want to do something uh, uh, crazy. That's fine. If you want to do that, I have no problem. Um, but if you don't write that down, uh, you're, I may get confused when marking it and thinking, that why is he talking about mass uh, instead of displacement, right? So please... You know, make it clear if you're using non-standard variables. But these are the ones that you'll typically encounter in the book. Um, the other one that you sometimes see in the book is x minus x0, where this little uh, uh, suffix here, 0, means the value of some condition, uh, uh, the initial value of some condition. So you'll see t0 for the initial time, x0 for initial position. Uh, uh, and, you know, if you're doing electromagnetism, you see i0 for initial current and things like that. Okay, so that's great. We can talk about changing our, uh, our displacement, but we want to have a little bit more information than that, so we have to define our next quantity, which is velocity. So this is the rate of change of displacement. We want to say how rapidly we are changing our displacement. So if you start at some position x naught at time t naught, um, and you move and get to a position x at time t, then we can calculate the mean velocity, the average velocity, as the 
total displacement divided by the total time, right? And so that's a macroscopic definition, but you calculate the mean velocity. It doesn't necessarily mean that the velocity of the object at this point here is exactly this. It just means that if you average the velocity over the entire trip, you will end up with this quantity, right? It's not an instantaneous one, it's the average. Okay, so simple question. We've got an Olympic 400 meter sprint, an athlete uh, uh, complete one circuit of an oval track in 50 seconds. So 400 meters, 50 seconds, oval track. What is their average velocity for the race? Okay, and what have we got for the answer? Wow, okay. So we've got a 50-50 a, a split just about, maybe a slight, slight edging out for, for eight meters per second. So, um, and, a, uh, uh, and one person going for seconds per meter. Um, okay, so turn to your neighbor and convince them that you've got the right answer since we've got such an even split. Okay, so let's try this again and see if anybody's managed to convince you to change your mind. Wow. Okay. So let's see what we got now. Wow. <laughs> okay, so the right answer is there, A, right? So first thing to learn from this if you stop and think about something, you can get the right answer, right? Because a huge number of you switched from, from D to A. So good lesson to learn in the exam is do not necessarily just write down the first thing that passes through your head. Stop and think about what you're writing because as we'll see when we go through the course, this happens 90% you know, of the time when I, when I do a question like this. Everybody then stops and thinks and talks about it and they shift to the right answer. So that's, that's the first lesson to learn. Okay, so why, uh, uh, why is it A and, and not D? Well, it's true, the total distance that the athlete has covered is 400 meters, and they covered that 400 meters in uh, uh, eight, no, sorry, in, in what, 50 seconds. So if you divided the 400 by 50, you would indeed end up with eight, and if you were asking what the average speed was, that indeed would be the right answer because you don't care in what direction they are moving if you're averaging the speed. But for velocity, what happens is you've got a, a, an oval track here. And so they start here and they head off around the track and uh, they arrive back here right next to it. And so if you look at the... Um, average velocity, it is the x minus x zero, that's the change in displacement, divided by t minus t zero, that's the change in time. Well, the displacement is zero. They've ended up back where they started, they haven't moved, right? So that's zero, and then it doesn't really matter what the time is. Um, if you haven't moved, it doesn't matter how long you've taken to not move, um, you, you've, you end up with zero velocity. Now, of course, this is the difference between instantaneous velocity and average velocity. What we're calculating here is the average velocity around the track. Velocity is a vector, so the athlete spends as much time running this way as they spend running that way, and they spend as much time running you know, down as they spend running up. And if you average all those things together, you end up with zero, right? Because this cancels with this, this cancels with that. And so the average is zero, but obviously if you've seen someone run around a 400 meter track, if you measure their velocity at one instance in time, it's not zero, very clearly not zero, but the average velocity is. So it's because velocity is a vector and not a, a scalar quantity that that uh, uh, is important. Okay, so well, next one is plotting velocity. So as you'll no doubt be learning, or probably already know, in physics we love to make graphs and plots of things, right? So uh, um, 
the, uh, we can plot velocity. So a typical type of plot that we will do is you will measure something's position um, versus time. So if you're plotting uh, the position of something versus the time, then you'll end up with a series of points and you can draw a line through them. So in this case, this object's position linearly increases with time. And you can ask, well, if we look at the gradient of this, well, at this time we started here, and at this later time we were at this position here. So if we draw a, a, a triangle, right angle triangle, with one line parallel to the x-axis, one line parallel to the uh, y-axis, then here along the time axis we can see the length of this is the change in time between this position and that position. And you get a change in displacement um, that's associated with that change in time, that's the length of this vertical line here. So if we want to calculate the gradient of the line, well, gradient is change in y divided by change in x. And so our change in our y-coordinate is just our change in position. Our change in the x-coordinate is the change in time. So our gradient here is delta x divided by delta t, and that's our definition for velocity. So if you've got a plot of position versus time, the gradient of that line tells you the object's velocity. And so you can read the object's velocity straight off the position versus time uh, plot. So quick last question. Uh, which of these plots represents a constant negative velocity? So A, B, C, or D? Okay, see what we got. Ah, excellent. We have a winner. Uh, that that in, indeed is the correct answer. So uh, that's the only plot with a uh, negative gradient. Um, and the one that was trying to fool you was the, uh, the one here with negative values, but it still has a positive gradient. Okay, so we'll carry on kinematics on uh, Friday. <laughs>